At a Fox town hall tonight, the former president refused to say something very important. Sean Hannity tried to give Donald Trump an out to put to bed these stories about a second term and what it would look like and whether there is a, a specter of authoritarianism or fascism. Trump refused to say no. Any way have any plans whatsoever, if re-elected president, to abuse power, to break the law, to use the government to go after people? You mean like they're using right now. So, <laughs> in the history of our country, what's happened to us, again, has never happened before. Over nonsense, over nothing, made up charges. I want to go back to, to this one issue, though, because the media has been focused on this and attacking you yeah. under no circumstances. You are promising America tonight. You would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Joining me now is Tim Alberta. He's a staff writer for The Atlantic, and he's also the author of the new book, The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory, American Evangelicals in an Age of Extremism. Tim, thanks for staying up for us. Uh, perfect person of course. for this particular moment, as always. But uh, that, from the Trump town hall, is pretty extraordinary. I mean, once again, Hannity, you know, it's almost like leading a horse to water and asking him to drink, and he won't do it. Why? Won't he simply say the answer is no? You know, I've called this before like the Fifth Avenue theory, Abby. Remember when Trump in 2016 said that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it? And he has, over the past eight years, almost seemed to play this game where he wants to see how much he can get away with. He just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And frankly, in that setting, Answering the question the way that he did, or I guess more accurately, not answering the question the way that he did, uh, he re he knows he can get away with it. He realizes that there's no consequence for it. There's never been any consequence, at least not from his base. And so he's going to keep playing these games until uh, it, it's almost like the hot stove thing, right? It, like until he really gets burned by it. I don't think we should expect anything else, but it is just extraordinary to pause and reflect on that. Yeah. Like he's, yeah, Hannity begging him, like, "Come on, really though, you're not gonna, you're not gonna turn into a tyrant, are you?" He's like, "Huh? Ah, ah, yeah. I might." You I know, mean, you know what it reminds me of? The the last time we saw Trump kind of pull something like this was just before the 2020 election, when he was repeatedly asked, "Will you accept the results of the election if you lose?" And he refused to say. Yep. And then afterward, he refused to accept the results of the election. So it's not just a rhetorical game. I mean, the audience was laughing. This could be a, a signal of what is to come. Yeah, it's almost like we should start taking him seriously, right? I mean, even even a couple of, I think it was 36 hours or so, a couple of days after the election, I believe it was November 5th, when Trump gave the speech from the, the White House, where he basically said, we're living in a banana republic. You can't trust our elections anymore. It's been stolen from me. Yeah. You, the people, need to do something about this. And I remember being horrified and, and 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 fearful at that point of what was going to happen and everybody was shrugging it off so oh, this is just what he says this is this is you know his shtick and it's like well okay but hold on there are tens of millions of people who voted for this man and who believe him when he says these things so it seems as though just as with your example where he was almost priming people for how he might behave in the aftermath of that election is he now priming people yet again to say, yeah, I, I, I might just pursue an authoritarian style of governing, and and um, and maybe people won't really have yeah. a problem with that. You you kind of touch on this in your book. You talk about Cal Thomas, who plays a pretty important role in the, you know the rise of modern evangelicalism, and he said this to you about. Uh, evangelical Christians, he says, you can't have a legitimate conversation with these people who are all in on Trump, because if you find any flaw in him, even flaws that are demonstrable, they either excuse it or attack you. I mean, does that, what he's describing there, uh, make you or, even, or him worry that that's a recipe for authoritarianism? Well, especially, Abby, yes. I mean, it, it makes me worry. And I think especially when you you take the the elements of authoritarianism but then you inject the religious zealotry and the religious justification not from Trump himself but from this base of conservative right-wing white evangelicals whom he has cultivated over the past 8 years 
And these are folks who, if you look at January 6th, some of the religious imagery around uh, the siege of the Capitol, if you look at the language he deploys when he's in front of explicitly evangelical audiences, talking about giving back power to Christianity, yeah. wanting to sort of take on Christian, Christianity's enemies in the culture. I mean, this is loaded language, and you don't have to look far to see just overseas in Ukraine, Russia's invasion was loaded with this sort of religious identitarian rhetoric, and Trump in some ways is borrowing from that same playbook, so yeah. it's very worrisome. So I want to play for you something that Trump said over the weekend. Listen. But I think if you had a real election and Jesus came down and God came down and said, I'm going to be the scorekeeper here, I think it would win there, I think it would win in Illinois, and I think it would win in New York. Are evangelicals mm. comfortable with that? That you invoking God and Jesus in his quest to sort of claim that he deserves to win everywhere? You know, if you had asked me that question, just a few years ago, Abby, I would have said, no, of course not. But I think we have to recognize how dramatically the paradigm has shifted here and how Donald Trump has sort of rewritten the rules uh, inside the modern evangelical movement. I mean, look, in many ways, what Trump has effectively done is he has conditioned evangelical Christians in this country, at least the, the, the millions of them who are loyal to him and to the MAGA movement, to expect that sort of rhetoric, to expect this sort of antagonism, this pugilism, and anything short of that almost doesn't pass muster. Like, if you watch Mike Pence as he campaigned for president, he'd go in front of evangelical audiences and talk about civility, talk about decency, talk about turn the other cheek, and he would get booed. Yeah, he, he would get jeered. He'd practically booed off the stage. Yeah. I mean, so I, it just, yeah. it, it, it seems like we've, we've lived through in a very condensed period of time here, just almost a wholesale remaking of that, that alliance between the evangelical movement and the Republican Party, and, and Trump is obviously at the yeah, tip of the Yeah, it makes you wonder if there is, has been a break between evangelicalism and its religious, you know, origins. Now that Trump has sort of made it not necessarily about all the, the sort of values of Christianity, but about other things, about his personality, about who he is as a person. Well, you know, there was, there was some fascinating uh, research done during Trump's presidency that showed that there was an uptick in, uh, in, in white conservatives who were self-identifying as evangelical, even as simultaneously the number of white conservatives who were attending church was going down. So there is an identification yeah. phenomenon here where for many of these folks, evangelical is now a cultural, a political, a tribal label that is basically hollowed out of its spiritual meaning, which I think is just, it does an incredible disservice to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for those of us who believe in that gospel and who feel that we have a responsibility to evangelize, to, to take that gospel to the nations and to try and share the news of Jesus Christ, that we, it's hard to do that when everyone now attaches this political label to the term itself. All right, Tim Alberta, thank you so much for joining us. And everyone, pick up his book, uh, The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory, available right now. Thanks so much. Thanks, Abby.